Also a song, if you ever had Master Life, you had to memorize that, right? The steadfast love of the Lord is forever. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is his faithfulness, O Lord. Great is your faithfulness. I mean, we could go home after that. <laughs> and after, not after my singing, but uh, after that moment. Now, I'll tell you, because I am concerned uh, that I, you know, I get off on tangents when I get excited, I really want to slow down for a moment and just be sure of uh, rehearsing for a moment our focal point here and our purpose of our study of Joshua, the first chapter. I think what I hope we will experience is that we'll, we'll reaffirm and reiterate the timeless biblical message that the Almighty God cares for us. Do you believe that this morning? God cares for us and that he will strengthen us and he will guide us and he will fulfill our promises. Our promises? His promises. His promises. Savor that for a moment. Let's consider it together, and let's pray to him that he might guide us as we study God's word together. Father, we pause to plead with you in this moment that you write on our hearts this passage of Holy Scripture today. And as our hearts resonate with the truths you reveal to us, may we be inspired to join the course of saints who have similar experiences as ours. May we be strengthened, may we be guided, may we be prepared to proclaim with the saints before us, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. I'm dyslexic and I'm blind, so I'm going to have to stay close to my notes. On, on my uh, first deployment to a uh, war zone, a friend came and gave me a book, which was fascinating to me. Um, it, was a, it was a book of sermons, of all things. Maybe they thought I needed to learn how to preach. But it was, it was actually a compilation of uh, sermons that the first church in Glastonbury, Connecticut had uh, compiled. Their pastor, um, uh, Dr. Carl Schulz, had resigned after 35 years of service. And they tried to think of how they might honor those years of service. They put together this, this uh, series, uh, this collections of, of um, sermons. And uh, quite frankly, I was, I was uh, inspired by them. But the most impactful thing about this, this whole process was the title of the book, because it says in a few simple words the impact that their leader had on them over 35 years. And he simply said, and it is the title of my sermon, Faith Faces Forward. I believe that indeed this encapsulates all that we're going to study today. And as we, as we look at God's word in Joshua, the first chapter, um, you, you need to realize, though, that while we talk about these key leaders, while we talk about Moses and Joshua, the, there is a much greater story here. There is not much more import into what is being communicated in this transference of power from one leader to another. But let's first consider um, about... Uh, consider these two prophetic leaders. Uh, John Hamilton suggests uh, of this story, this Joshua story, and I don't mean it as a fictitious story, but as the stories that unfolds for us of God's journey with God's people. He says this, there was in this period, same period of time a profound shift in the kingdom struggle, um, which goes on in every one of our ages, in every one, every transition that takes place in our lives. The setting itself is in the period of the social breakdown at the end of the Bronze Age, 
uh, perhaps we feel a little social breakdown even in our own scenarios. And in the beginning of the Iron Age, when God's servants under the leadership of Joshua was forming the nucleus of a liberated and a liberating people. Do you get that? It was these people were not only being liberated themselves, they were not only being brought out of bondage, out of the wilderness, into a land that God had promised them, but they were on a mission to be a liberating people as well. And the crucible, I think, of, of that time, I think we can find that our story is very similar. A story of how God does not change, the, the God that does not change, changes what seems to be unrecoverable tragedy and transforms it into something that's not only profoundly beautiful, but transforming to God's people and to God's world. Let me ask you, this morning, as we consider this passage of Scripture, which way are you facing? Where is your heart? Where is your soul? Where is your eyes focused? Let's, let's consider and try to be faithful to the text so that, that what it, it what we're suggesting today of facing forward is that it, it will be both truthful it will, and it will be inspirational for us to apply to our own lives. I think, first of all, if you look at verse 1 and 2, facing forward often means accepting responsibilities and responsibilities that are often daunting and beyond our own reach. And I, I'm not just implying in church life, but I think in life in general. Look at this. As, as you read scripture, as you read this scripture, if you were to read the whole of Joshua, you know what you find? At the very beginning, you find a funeral, and at the very end, you find three other funerals. You find uh, Joshua dying after 110 years, having brought them into the land, helping them enter into a covenant with, God's, with, it, with the people, and not only prospering, but also pro having profound influence upon the, the promised land, the people of the promised land that they came to, uh, to dwell with. But you also find, of course, uh, and I would, would um, also mention Joseph. Joseph obviously was a dead a long time ago, but they brought his bones with him. And they brought him to, to be buried, and very symbolically, isn't it, in the promised land. And then we have also Eliezer mentioned, son of Aaron, in verse uh, 24, uh, 33 of uh, chapter 24. Why do I mention funerals and get off track already? Because this. Nothing could take place in, in, in the book of Joshua. The, the, the Jordan crossing would not take place until one last thing occurred. It was the death of Moses. It was the death of the leader that, that changed the life of Israel, that, that stood up against Pharaoh, that brought him to his knees, that parted the Red Sea, that led them safely across a, a, a desert to face and to look at the promised land. And yet he had to go before God's people could inherit the land. Let's look at this for, for just a moment. Consider it just a moment because I think it is, it is vitally important. The lesson that I take away from this study is that no personality, no matter how great the leader is, no matter how great a preacher the, that you have in the pulpit, it is, that is not the focal point, is it? The focal point is that the person that has come, being come to lead, has been called by God, set apart by God, and, and placed in that position for a season. And the God that changes not is the one that leads them, not only through the desert, he's the one that feeds them, he's the one that performs the miracles, and he's the one that will give them the land to come. Deuteronomy 34 gives us a, a little bit more of a picture of what of this transition. Now, I want you to say this because God is loves Moses, does he not? It is obvious by the, the way that he pursued him, he called him, he gave him power to lead a people through the midst of a desert to, to the promised land. But he the interesting thing was 
the final scene in chapter 34. As they talked about the death of Moses. He, Moses, walks with God one last time. Don't you love that? As a minister, my father was dying with cancer, spoke to my church in Middletown when I pastored there. And he is his last, last sermon. He said, look, the one thing that I know, that I want you to know above all, that Jesus loves you. And he, he just poured out his heart to us. This, I don't want you to look, overlook. Read, open your Bibles and look at, at chapter 34. This is not just a record of somebody's death. This is an intimate moment of a godly person having served God faithfully, falling at times, but serving him faithfully, having one last chance to walk with him up Mount Nemo to Pisgah and to look out across the land and to see the joy and the blessing that God was giving the people that he loved and he cared for all of his life. He says, I want you to see it one last time before you lay down and die. No one, none of the prophets that we find recorded in history, had ever had the experience of seeing God face to face. As a matter of fact, they believed that if you looked upon God, that you would be, so, you would be consumed. He is too great. He's too powerful. He's too awesome for you to be able to look into his eyes. But this Moses, this Moses had the privilege of doing that. So I, I say all that to you to, <laughs> to set the stage for jo Joshua. Yes, he was a mentor. Yes, he followed him around. Yes, he saw the miracles. Yes, he was one of two, Caleb, the other, that, that came and uh, with a favorable report the first time that they were there. But he was no Moses. God calls, I think, his people and his ministers, and he prepares them for a certain moment in the time in the history of God's, God's people's lives. And according to the needs to extend and, and to embellish the, the, the kingdom of God, Joseph does come, I think, uh, to assume a daunting task. Now, I, I say that, and I don't want to overly emphasize this, this idea of the pastoral leadership and kind of the innuendo of, of your calling a pastor in just, just a, a few weeks. I, I want you to see that this calling upon our lives is not just to stand up and preach, to have the privilege of doing that, but for every one of us. And you'll find later on, right, as, as we go, go through this and rehearse this whole of the chapter, I'll try to get through it quickly, what you'll find at the end of the book, he says, look, look, Joseph, uh, J Joshua, <laughs> We believe, we, we really do believe that God has called you to do this. And, and look, if anybody disobeys you, we'll kill you. Now, kill them. Now, don't do that in church life. But he did, it, did this, it, it just shows the depth of commitment that they had, right, to the man that God had called them. But they also turn, as God had instructed Joshua, at the very first he says, look, your task is not to be Moses. Your task is to be strong and courageous. And in 18, the people say to them, yes, we'll follow you. Yes, we trust you. Yes, we believe God has called you. But your task is to be strong and courageous. And the only way to be strong and courageous is to be in the Lord and to be in his power and to be in his presence, and to allow him to lead us and guide us through life. Which way is your life facing? Is it facing toward God Almighty? Is it facing toward his will, his power, his strength, his trust in the promise that where two or three are gathered together in his name, that I will be there and do something profound? I believe that's what Scripture teaches us. There's one last lesson that uh, is not biblical, but I, I, I thought it was applicable, that, that, uh, that I would teach you about this transition of power. Uh, over the entrance of the archives of the building in Washington, I've never seen it in Washington, D.C., there are these words, what is past is prologue. What is past in your life 
in your church's life is merely prologue in the journey, uh, your spiritual journey, and in your walk with the Lord. There is forever a future. There is forever a blessing to be had in the distance. Joshua led the people to the promised land. God led Moses to the heavenly promised land. We will get there one day. And there is until that day, we should always, always, always face forward. Let's consider this a little bit further because I think Scripture supports this. Facing forward with confidence requires an understanding of God's intent. So what? We're gonna, now we're all fired up, right? We're going to follow you. We're going to do the thing. So what do you want us to do? What is it that you want us to accomplish as God's people? Joshua, I think, occupies a key, key position in the Bible because of his relationship to God's promise to Abraham. And that's the link the promise to Abraham. The first promise was that God would give Abraham's descendants the land of Canaan. Genesis 1, 1 uh, um, uh, in 15, 7. The intent is for the people to be the sole, not to, is never intended for them to be the sole recipients of this blessing. Can I underscore that enough? This church, this building is not here. The resources that you have, the monies that you have is not for you alone. Now, I hope that it is a blessing to you and the things that that occur here are, are, are for God's glory and honor. But this land that has been given you is also like, like with Joshua. It's for people like Rahab or the Gibbonites or others that came to help and to assist as God's people conquered the land. And as he calls, as Joshua calls all those that had been conquered, all those that, that had been a part of the family of God uh, as they took that land, he calls on them to say, and he, he says, Look, you can worship the other gods, but as for me and my family, I will worship the Lord. It was a call that, that not only for the congregation, but a call, a plea, an opportunity for those who never knew God's grace and his mercy and his love to come to understand and appreciate what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I find it interesting that as we look at the intent of Joshua, could we just reflect back on, since we talked about Joseph's bones, <laughs> um, it says, you, you, it's a very familiar passage. Remember Genesis 15, 19, and 20? It simply says this, but Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. I am in the place of God. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. He's talking about his brothers. But God intended it for good to accomplish what was being done for the saving of many lives. Can you underscore that? In your memories, in your hearts, and as you face forward, understand that all that we do is for the saving of many lives. The same thing is true as Christ dies upon the cross, as the, 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 the Yeshua, uh, the, the, the Yeshua, <laughs> Uh, uh, in, the, in the Hebrew, we know the word, Joshua means Savior, does it not? The same thing that in Greek, that Jesus, the same name is used. Jesus becomes the Savior. He becomes the one like, like Joseph, but even more importantly, in that he was God with us. He dies on the cross for us. He takes away our sins, and he promises us not only an opportunity, a faith journey here on earth, but he, as, as Moses inherited, we have an inheritance in heaven. We have a promised land that has been promised to us, and it is safe, and it is sure. If we will follow him if we'll only be strong and be courageous if we'll only live for the Lord Jesus Christ we will find this 
and we'll find it without being intimidated or uh, losing heart or sight. From Joseph, uh, from, from, uh, uh, Joseph to Joshua to Jesus, God intends is always um, to dispel fear, to bring peace and wholeness, and always for the saving of many souls. But can we not just as quickly say that the world's intent is to enslave and to subjugate God, to make him our God instead of we his? The future belongs, I think, to those who are prepared to be responsive to God's love and it's his intent to redeem the world for his glory. Facing, faith, facing forward requires a devotion. It's not a, he gives us something tangible here. It's a devotion to the word of God. Look at verse 8 again. What is he telling? He's talking to us about the Torah. He's talking to us about the, what they had in hand at the time. The, the, the words that had been given and passed down to them, what did he ask them to do? He, he said, look, read it, study it, memorize it. What is he saying? I think it's, it's just as important for us to get a, uh, uh, to um, allow God's word to get its grip on us as it is for us to get a grip on the word. Many, uh, here's my, the intent of what I'm trying to say here. Many of us have sound doctrine. Boy, you could, you could argue and fight with anyone under the sun about what is right and appropriate and truth and win the debate. But Christianity and faith is not about your ability and your skills to debate or to be right. This is a, a work of the heart. It's a work of intimacy and relationship of a God who wants to be a part of your life, who wants to teach you how to live life. And, and the words, as it becomes a part of our heart, is transformed from something that is simply a harsh tool, that is a law that, that we can beat over someone else's head because they're not living up to it or obeying it, to it, obey, obeying it. but it is a word that breathes life into our souls. It, it brings joy into our, the presence, of, when we experience the presence of God. We, it, it brings us truth in the midst of darkness, and when we can recite, great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. When we remember God's word and it speaks into our lives and our situations, it gets its grip on us. It makes life more profound and powerful. It takes the, the, the simple, the sparrow, and it makes it sacred. Verse 8 reveals that God's prescription for transforming our appreciation for the word to a word of, um, from a word of good to know to a word that's worth dying for. Do not overlook the spiritual resources that you already have, which are available to you, not only the word, but prayer, meditation, worship, the support of your Christian faith in community, your friends, your confidence, your talk with God himself, all those, all those cha change and transform us into vessels that are useful to the kingdom of God. There, I, I, I love the story uh, of, of the unfolding of the church and of Acts. You remember, you remember in Acts 2? On the day of Pentecost, we, we glorify that. And I, I say, what an amazing moment, right? Where the Holy Spirit comes down, great revival takes place, thousands of people have, uh, have given their lives to Christ. But what happened afterwards? That's the profound thing. They continued to grow. You know why? Because they shared meals together. 
And because they talked about what they had experienced, and because they learned from one another and they loved one another, and other people in the community that were in darkness saw the light in these people, and they said, what's going on here? They were intrigued. They wanted to know what these people had that I don't have. That's the transforming power of understanding God's Word and having it live and breathe in our hearts and in our souls. Martin Luther King, the great reformer, uh, King, he wasn't King, Martin Luther, <laughs> the great reformer, um, you remember uh, his, um, his famous words as he was called to, to recant his faith, his trust in Scripture, and his, his belief in the, 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 what the just shall live by faith. Simply says these words, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Thus, I cannot and will not recant because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Could that be your prayer today in this moment as we consider God's word? Here I stand. I'm betting my life on it. Maybe that's not a good response. But I'm, I'm giving everything, I'm investing everything because I know that it's God and His Word that will bring me eternal life. Well, I, I know I'm, I'm, I never get to preach, so you get, you're getting it all. But let me, let me share at least a couple other things. Real quick, I'll, I'll be quick. Face, facing forward, I think, comes from the encouragement of God's presence. It would, it would be futile for us to simply, as this morning, if you think we're just sitting here run, kind of rehearsing some old stories and, and just trying to stir you up and encourage you, well, that's wonderful. But it will not amount to much if you leave this place and if you don't realize or appreciate the fact that for God's people, that God is present. That he, is not, he does not have a deaf ear, that he's not turned away from us, that he is indeed, as in the psalmist in Psalm 116, he has cupped his ear, he's jumped down into the ditch of our life, and he is listening to us. God is here. Look at this. Uh, in Joshua 1.5, I'll be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Can you hear God saying that to you now? I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Joshua 9, do not be afraid. He repeats this over and over again. Half, you, you look at scripture, you look at the stories, half of it is talking about stop being afraid. Why are we afraid? Because we don't believe that God is leading us. Because we don't believe that God is standing in front of us, leading us further and deeper and into more meaningful ministry and relationship. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1.17, and, and may the Lord, it's again the response of God's people, hearing this, being inspired by this, he, they turn and say, and may the Lord your God be with you, Joshua, as he was with Moses. So what's the takeaway? Confidence doesn't come from looking at, the, uh, at what's inside you. It comes from seeing the one who stands beside you. Facing forward requires a faith that not only appreciates God's presence, but, but he understands that faith inspires us to do something, to action. Moses, uh, Moses dies, and what, is, what is immediately takes place in this story. He says, all right, that, that component is, is, is now taken care of. Everything is now in place, in, incomplete. Now pack your bags. Get up. Start moving, and I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the land that I promised you. One of the things, one of the takeaways I, I got from uh, uh, Dr. Schultz's book was a great quote. He says, when there is no faith in the future, there's no power in the present. Isn't that amazing? I, I believe that to be true, and I believe that what is what God is saying to Moses and, and, and to the, the people of Israel. Remember... 
They were there before. They were standing on this bank. They were ready to go in, and they said, wait, wait a minute. I, I'm not sure we're ready for this. I'm not sure we can, you know, they're giants in the land. It's too much for us. And as a result, they had to wait a whole generation. They had to go and to wander around until everyone was dead. But two, the two spies that had gone in and came back and said, God is with us. He will give us this land. Joshua and Caleb. Well, if he, if he assures us that he's with us, he keeps coming back and telling us over and over again in the story to uh, this simple phrase, be strong and courageous. I won't rehearse them all, but look at it. Verse 6, verse 7, verse 9, verse 18. Your only task as a faithful, faith, uh, face-forwarding people is to be strong and courageous. Think about that for a moment. God's presence is a thing that gives us strength, does it not? Now, what does he mean by strong? Let me, let me just define it by Webster's Dictionary. It's not easily injured or disturbed. It's solid. It's not easily subdued or taken. You be strong. Do not allow the world to crush you. You know what was going to happen. The greatest test was not getting across the desert. The greatest test was not having God uh, feed you every day, take care of you, protect you. But now you've come to possess a land and you're going to have to sit down beside ungodly people. And the temptation of God's people is always to compromise, is it not? Is you go along to get along. It's, well, it's your opinion, but my opinion is this. God, in, you rehearse this whole end of this, this story in verse 23 and 24. He says, look, bury those gods. They are not worth it. You be unique. You cause the people, the community in which you live, to ask the question, why do they love one another so much? Why do they love me so much? Why do they care about my soul? Why do they care about where my life is going or this community is going or this world is going? It is because they are loved by Jesus Christ. Be strong and courageous. Courage is the mental or moral strength to venture, to persevere, and to withstand danger, fear, or difficulty. It is impossible not to be afraid, not to cower, not to be intimidated by this world if God is not with us. Emerson wrote, the supreme lesson of life is to learn what the centuries say against the hours. <laughs> it is intimidating. I, I was very fearful uh, going to a war zone the first time. Didn't know what to expect, never been there. And certainly expect, I was going to the hospital, so I was expecting a lot of death and, and a lot of, a lot of uh, torn up bodies and lives torn apart. What would it have been like to stand there? Where, where are you standing? You might be in a very, very intimidating place. Very easy to look at the moment. I'm, I'm reminded of the story. You remember the story of, of the disciples on the sea, Christ asleep in the back, storm comes up. You know the story, right? He's asleep, they, and he won't wake up. <laughs> and what's the question? It's exactly what it is here. Don't you care that we're drowning? Don't, don't you care about who we are, all this that was invested in you, and you don't care that we're drowning? So he wakes up, and what does he say? Peace be still. Well, that's a, that's a rem reminder of the God that we're worshiping and serving. But you know the, the other little tidbit about that story is fascinating to me? It's one that we often overlook as we tell this dramatic story, as we talk about the power of God. It's simply said in Mark's account, and there were other little ships with them. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> you have Jesus in the boat. 
You have the, the creator of the heavens and earth. You have the one who simply speaks and life changes. And there are other little ships all around you in the same storm without a savior. Wow. Be strong and courageous with your eyes on Christ. Be honest for a moment. Don't, don't answer me. I want, just turn your eyes toward heaven and answer God. Which direction are you facing? Is my life focused on Christ, on the kingdom, on the transformation of this world? Are you facing forward with an openness to God's purpose and plan? Are, are you refining your focus as God's word speaks to you and speaks into your heart to help you? Are you willing to live the life-giving word with passion? That's what Christ's, what God asks of you today as we conclude this message. May God bless you.